Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the Lewy Body Dementia Association for today's webinar. My name is Angela Taylor, and I'm the Senior Director of Research and Advocacy at LBDA, and I'm happy to be serving as your host for the next hour. Our topic today is navigating LBD. Is this a crisis? Before I introduce our guests, uh, I have a few, a few housekeeping announcements for you um, so that everyone can hear the presentation. All attendee lines will be remain muted throughout the event. If you have any technical problems during today's event, please post them in the chat window so that one of our team can respond to you. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel for on-demand viewing. And we hope that you'll share the link uh, on social media. It'll be up in a day or two. And today's presentations are going to be followed by a question and answer session. So if you have any questions for our guests as they're doing their presentation, you'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button. Just click on that and submit your question using that screen. And we'll address as many questions as we can in the time allotted after the presentations. So let me move on to introducing our guests today. Dr. Daniel Weintraub is Professor of Psychiatry and Neurology at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. And he's a psychiatrist at the Parkinson's Disease Research, Education, and Clinical Center at the Philadelphia VA Medical Center. A board-certified geriatric psychiatrist, he conducts clinical research in the psychiatric and cognitive complications of Parkinson's disease. He serves on multiple task forces and working groups of the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society, chairs the Cognitive and Behavioral Work Group of the Fox Foundation-funded Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative, is an advisor to the Critical Path for Parkinson's Consortium, and is an associate editor for the Movement Disorders Journal. He's also a co-investigator at the University of Pennsylvania's LBDA Research Center of Excellence and is a longtime member of our Scientific Advisory Council. Suzanne Reichwein has been with the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center at Penn Medicine since 1997 and is currently the manager of research and clinical programs. She received her bachelor's degree in social work from the University of Pittsburgh and master's in social work from Rutgers University. While a social worker by education, Suzanne has worked in clinical research during her time at Penn, and she runs support groups as well as educational programs, and has initiated multidisciplinary clinics at the PDMDC, working closely with physicians, nurses, rehabilitation therapists. And her primary interest is in counseling, the counseling of patients and family members. Uh, as a native of Philadelphia, she resides in the city with her husband and daughter. So we're delighted to have both of you with us today. Thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Um, I will um, enjoy turning things over now to Dr. Weintraub. Get his line un unmuted. So I think I'm on now. Um, are you there, Angela? Yes, I'm here. We can hear you. Go right ahead. Thanks, sure. Okay. Um, thank you for the introduction, and I'm going to lead off by presenting a limited number of slides focused on some crises or emergencies that can arise from a psychiatric standpoint, and I'll focus on the medical aspects, medication components of these situations. Um, Suzanne, at the end of that, will then have the opportunity to add um, whatever she wants to more from the education and behavioral management component, a key aspect of these situations, working closely with families and patients as she does. So together, we'll be able to team up and provide as much information as we can about these kinds of situations. Okay, so if we can advance to the next slide. As a geriatric psychiatrist that works closely with primarily Parkinson's disease patients, a fair percentage of whom have cognitive impairment and also dementia with Lewy body disorder patients, these were some scenarios that I came up with, we came up with together, that arise in the context of clinical care um, that are emergencies or acute situations that require prompt 
attention, and management. And there's eight of them, and we'll go through them one by one. Next slide. First is psychosis. So psychosis to a psychiatrist involves two components. One is hallucinations, and one would be delusions. And together, both of those fall under the umbrella term of psychosis. What we've learned about psychosis, um, I would say more in Parkinson's disease, but also within dementia with Lewy bodies, is that it's not only visual hallucinations, as is often emphasized, and maybe we thought at one point was almost exclusively the occurrence. We recognize now that if we're going to assess patients for psychosis in the context of Lewy body disorders, and I'll just use that word Lewy body disorders or Lewy body dementia to encapsulate both Parkinson's dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies, that you have to ask about auditory hallucinations, which means hearing things that aren't there, voices, for instance, tactile hallucinations, the sense of feeling something that's not there, olfactory hallucinations, smelling things that aren't there, and of course, visual hallucinations, seeing things that aren't there. The other component, the major component, um, in addition to hallucinations, are what we call delusions, which are typically of a paranoid nature, but can take other forms as well. But a paranoid delusion is a belief that something is true that other people do not believe to be true. Most commonly, that might be that there's imposters in the house, that one's spouse is not being faithful, um, that somebody has been exchanged for somebody else, somebody you're looking at is, is a different person than they actually are. Um, so that would be some of the typical delusional ideas that somebody might have. One thing that we recognize, and this will get to one of the future slides, is that psychosis in general tends to have not a sudden onset or a sudden worsening um, or a severe case out of the blue. When those kinds of things or scenarios arise, then we start to think about an acute medical or neurological condition that might be causing these hallucinations or changes in thinking. So when we talk about the management of psychosis, in terms of what's particularly um, helpful perhaps or important for family members, loved ones, caregivers, who's ever in the role of supporting the patient, is that we recommend that patients not be confronted or challenged about the things that they're experiencing sensory-wise or believing in terms of thought process. But on the other hand, we also don't recommend that a person should endorse the symptoms, that you should agree that what's being seen is really there or what is believed to be true is really true. So it's walking this fine line. So the strategy is not, again, to confront, but also not to endorse the symptoms and to find some kind of middle ground, which may involve changing the environment in some way. As I mentioned in the next box, we tend to differentiate between chronic from acute psychosis, with the latter acute psychosis more likely to be delirium, which we'll cover on a subsequent side slide. When we talk about the management from a medication standpoint, we do sometimes use antipsychotics for these symptoms. I'd say about 50% of Parkinson's disease patients that are experiencing psychosis are treated with an antipsychotic. The number is maybe lower in dementia with Lewy bodies because of concerns about their use. In the latest guidelines that came out a few years ago for dementia with Lewy bodies, it says that antipsychotics should be avoided if possible, but if they are used, it should be an atypical antipsychotic with a specific reference to one being made, quetiapin, also known as Seroquel in terms of the brand name, because that's the antipsychotic that most clinicians have experience and comfort with in Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. Less that there's a lot of evidence to support their use, but more that clinicians are, are comfortable, that they um, 
have some sense of the side effects and tolerability of this medication and also whether it's helpful or not. An important component now is that we recognize that patients should not be considered to be on these medications permanently once they're placed on them. That there should be some consideration if a patient has a response to the antipsychotic after some period of time, and there's not a clear recommendation for what that time frame should be, but consideration being given to decreasing and potentially discontinuing the medication because there's some long-term concerns about adverse events and even increased risk of mortality or death with long-term exposure to these medications and the psychotics in patients with dementia. I did want to mention in terms of antipsychotics before we move on that there was a recent study, very recent, in the past couple of weeks that was concluded that was a study of a newer antipsychotic that's been available and approved by the FDA for Parkinson's disease psychosis for several years now, and it's called pimavanserin, or the brand name for that is Muplazid. And in this latest study, it was conducted in five dementia-related psychosis conditions. So dementia with Lewy bodies, Parkinson's disease dementia, also Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, and frontotemporal dementia. It was treating psychosis in patients with one of those five dementias. And in an interim analysis for that study, it was shown that the medication was beneficial, so the study was terminated. And now the company that makes the compound is going back to the FDA to see if it can be approved for the general condition of dementia-related psychosis, which would include psychosis in Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies, so of relevance to our conversation today. Okay, that was what I was going to say on that topic, so we can move on to the next slide now. Agitation and insomnia often go hand in hand, so that's why I included them together here. They also can go hand in hand with psychosis. So some of the same things that were mentioned on the previous slide apply here as well. So agitation and insomnia, in addition, we're often in combination with psychosis, are major contributors to institutionalization in patients with Parkinson's disease, dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies. So these are very important issues. Loved ones, family members, caregivers can tolerate a lot, but one thing that's hard to tolerate is a lack of sleep or physical and verbal aggression or agitation that is frequent and often directed or can be directed at the caregiver. Those are the things that sometimes are just not able to be tolerated and then therefore can lead to a change in living situation. These symptoms often occur in the context, as I mentioned, of other conditions, agitation, insomnia, psychosis being one of them, but really an evaluation needs to consider that this could be an agitated depression Patients that have significant depressive symptoms can sometimes experience agitation and often changes in sleep as part of depression. Patients that are very anxious or nervous, restless, can also be agitated and have problems with sleep. So the evaluation really needs to consider additional psychiatric symptoms as well. Um, when we talk about agitation, just to go back one step to the beginning, what do we mean by that exactly? So this would include symptoms such as restlessness, wandering, verbal or physical aggression, irritability, repetitive behaviors. All of those kind of fall under the general category of agitation. When it comes to the management of agitation in dementias or Parkinson's disease, dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies, I would say that the first line class of medications now are antidepressants. The newer antidepressants that we use, typically those would be serotonin reuptake inhibitors or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, also known as SSRIs. And that literature is really based 
partly or largely on Alzheimer's disease agitation studies where there's been shown to be some benefit for antidepressants for the treatment of agitation. And because antidepressants in general tend to be better tolerated than antipsychotics, that's the reason that they've really become first-line treatments for agitation. Less so for insomnia, although there is one specific antidepressant, mirtazapine or remeron, that can be used um, to enhance sleep. There's a second one that's often commonly used for insomnia called trazodone. It's an antidepressant, but in lower dosages, we use it to help people sleep. So there's a couple of antidepressants that can help with the insomnia more specifically in addition to potentially agitation. I've mentioned the antipsychotics already, so don't need to go into more detail about that. Mood stabilizers are typically anti-seizure or anti-convulsant medications that can be used also to help treat agitation. They include compounds such as valproic acid, also known as Depakote, carbamazepine, also known as Tegretol, and gabapentin, also known as Neurontin. So those are anti-convulsant medications, also known as mood stabilizers. And then finally, sometimes for acute agitation, we resort to using benzodiazepines or anti, pure anti-anxiety medications. Some of the more commonly used ones include lorazepam, which is also known as Ativan, alprazolam, which is Xanax, diazepam, which is Valium. Now, as I mentioned at the bottom, those have to be used cautiously. Um, sometimes on just an as-needed basis or at the lowest dose possible or only temporarily because they do have the potential to worsen sedation, um, to cause more confusion, and to lead to balance problems. So for those reasons, these medications have to be used very cautiously in patients with Parkinson's disease, dementia, or dementia with Lewy bodies. Okay, I think I've covered what I wanted to on this slide. Third major category of acute conditions that have a psychiatric component is delirium. So delirium, by definition, is a change in attention, ability to focus or pay attention, an acute change in that ability. And it typically has a medical or neurological condition underpinning it, causing it. So anytime there's an acute change in attention, which can also include changes in alertness where people may be either hyper alert, i.e. agitated, or hypo alert, more somnolent or sleepy, accompanied by agitation, psychosis, typically visual hallucinations, um, general confusion, there can be delusional ideas as well. So that, those kinds of con that kind of constellation of symptoms that occur, occurs relatively acutely may fit the criteria for delirium. Um, there, besides um, common medical conditions, what are some of the common medical conditions that may cause that? Things such as a urinary tract infection in an older person, which might be noticed by changes in the color of urine or changes in the frequency or comfort of urination. Those may all be um, um, characteristic of a urinary tract infection. Another common one would be pneumonia. So it might be experienced by shortness of breath or coughing, trouble, more trouble breathing. Those are the kinds of conditions that are notorious for leading to delirium in elderly patients and elderly patients with cognitive impairment who have less re um, resistance um, or ability to ward off an infection like that without becoming acutely confused and um, changes in attention. Um, there's also medications that older patients are not uncommonly exposed to that can also lead to delirium, and they are medications with what we call anticholinergic properties. So anticholinergic properties means these are medications that block the brain chemical or neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which is a key brain chemical for attention, memory, concentration. 
the medications that block that chemical in the brain can lead to delirium. And probably the medication that most people would be familiar with that can do that are, um, is a medication called Benadryl, which is a common antihistamine taken over the counter for allergies or to help people sleep. It's in many PM medications, but it, the, the active compound in Benadryl is also known as diphenhedramine, has significant anticholinergic properties and can be associated with delirium in the elderly. Other medications that may contribute to this, I already mentioned benzodiazepines, but also opioids or narcotics. So any narcotic compound or narcotic-like compound, in the elderly, a narcotic-like compound commonly used is called tramadol or Ultram. Anything with opioid or opioid-like properties can also contribute to confusion in the elderly. The pain management preferentially or preferably is not with opioids in patients with dementia. One other point to make about um, delirium is that sometimes a patient is admitted to the hospital, it's quickly discovered that they have a urinary tract infection or when checking the blood, they notice that their sodium or potassium levels are off and that's why the person is, is confused. And those things can be corrected or treated pretty quickly. But that doesn't mean that the delirium is going to resolve, that the symptoms are going to resolve as quickly. Because in older patients, in patients with cognitive impairment, the symptoms of delirium can take weeks or even months to fully resolve. So just because it doesn't happen immediately doesn't mean that the patient isn't still going to improve um, significantly over time. Antipsychotics in, in an acute medical and surgical setting, if somebody is hospitalized, antipsychotics are still the treatment of choice for managing delirium. But there has been a study in the past year, a large randomized controlled trial, as we call it, where patients are randomized to either active treatment, in this case, one of two antipsychotics, or to the fake treatment, or placebo as it's known. And in this study, it was shown that antipsychotics were not superior or effective for the treatment of delirium. So we still use them clinically, but it was discouraging to see that there was a randomized controlled trial that was not positive for the use of antipsychotics in treating delirium in acute medical surgical settings. Right, so that's delirium. So we can move on to the next REM sleep behavior disorder, also known as RBD, is a sleep disorder that can occur starting in midlife or young adulthood um, even. And it's of great significance for Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies for a couple of reasons. One is, is that it's part of what we call the prodromal phase for many patients who end up having Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies. If somebody has idiopathic RBD in midlife, it increases their risk of developing Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies one day. And if you have dementia with Lewy bodies or Parkinson's disease already, the likelihood you will also have RBD at some point in the illness is high. So what is RBD? It's the physical and verbal acting out of dreams while one is asleep. Patients are often unaware of it. It's typically the bed partner, often a spouse, that's aware of it and they suffer the consequences of it if the person is flailing about in the middle of the night. The patient typically doesn't remember it because they are asleep while this is happening. And we don't know exactly why it happens, but what happens is that while the patient is dreaming, and we all dream every night, even if we don't remember it, most of us are paralyzed during, so to speak, um, during our dream phase of sleep. So we cannot physically or verbally act out our dreams. A fair percentage of patients with Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies lose that paralysis and are able to physically and verbally act out their dreams. And that's called REM behavior, sleep behavior disorder, or RBD. It 
typically, not always, but typically happens towards the early morning hours because that's the part of the sleep cycle where most of our um, REM sleep happens, most of our dreaming sleep happens. Um, in terms of treatment, medication treatment, there really have been no adequate treatment trials. There have been a few small ones. Um, the medication that's used preferentially is clonazepam, also known as clonopin, which is another one of those benzodiazepine or anti-anxiety medications I use. And clinically, it does seem to be effective, although we do not have good randomized controlled trials to support its use. And the other thing about clonazepam, similar to the other benzodiazepines I mentioned before, is that it can potentially lead to worsening cognition, gait, um, gait impairment, and sedation. We typically give it at bedtime, so the sedation may be less of an issue, but those other side effects need to be monitored for closely. Melatonin is also used clinically, commonly. The evidence for its um, use is limited, but it is a safe and well-tolerated medication overall. I think that's um, all I needed to say about RBD for the moment. Antipsychotic sensitivity has another name in the psychiatric literature called neuroleptic malignant syndrome, or NMS, as we would call it. And what this is is an acute, extreme, or serious adverse event to antipsychotic use. And this is really why, the main reason why, antipsychotics are used um, cautiously particularly in dementia with Lewy body patients, where there seems to be a greater concern with this than in Parkinson's disease, I would say. And this antipsychotic sensitivity or neuroleptic malignant syndrome would be after exposure to an antipsychotic, and it would present itself as fever, altered mental status, rigidity, autonomic changes. Autonomic changes mean changes in blood pressure, pulse, that are an acute medical situation that needs prompt attention, so emergency room evaluation. As I mentioned, the greatest concern is for dementia with Lewy body patients. It's thought to happen perhaps with older or what are called typical antipsychotics compared with newer or atypical antipsychotics, and that may have to do with their relative effect on the dopamine system compared with the serotonin system, that the older antipsychotics tend to block dopamine more than serotonin, and that may make them more likely to um, cause this antipsychotic sensitivity reaction. And that's the reason, therefore, that the latest guidelines for the management of dementia with Lewy bodies talk about using atypical antipsychotics if one is going to be used, and perhaps quetiapin particularly, because there seems to be some level of experience and reasonable tolerability with that compound. I will say, in having reviewed the literature for this, that the actual literature that has kind of raised the, the alarm bells about use of antipsychotics and dementia with Lewy bodies is limited. So it's not that these medications shouldn't be used cautiously, because they should be, but it's also true that we need a greater evidence base to really understand what the true risk is of using these medications in this population. In general, um, because of our concern with antipsychotics, particularly in dementia with Lewy body patients, when we do use them, we tend to start at a very low dosage. If we do make increases, we tend to do that gradually to help ensure that tolerability is okay. And then finally, we want to limit overall exposure to the medication because there may be an increased risk just the longer that you're taking it. So if you can treat somebody for a relatively acute period that would be preferable to just leaving the person on the medication. Okay, so that's that slide. Serotonin syndrome is a potential interaction that in this case would be more common in Parkinson's disease than in dementia with Lewy bodies. 
so the exact opposite of what we talked about on the last slide. And serotonin syndrome is when there's an interaction between two medications that increase the availability of the neurotransmitter or brain chemical serotonin. And essentially, any of the antidepressants that we use, of the newer antidepressants particularly, enhance serotonin function in one way or another. In addition, one of the commonly used medication classes in the treatment of Parkinson's disease, less so in dementia with Lewy bodies, but for Parkinson's disease, are called MAOB inhibitors. And the two that are used, in the United States anyway, are selegiline and resagiline. And that combination, um, any time a neurologist or a psychiatrist adds one of these medications to the other, it immediately brings up a red flag for the pharmacy about the possibility of serotonin syndrome. And similar to what I just said about antipsychotic sensitivity, the symptoms are very similar. There's mental status changes, there's rigidity, there's fever. All of this would have to prompt discontinuation of both medications and evaluation in an emergency room setting as quickly as possible. The data on how common this occurs is not good. We do know that these medications are commonly co-prescribed in Parkinson's disease, and I've been seeing patients on this combination or type of combination for close to 20 years now, and I've never personally had a case that I'm aware of. So it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. I think if it does happen, it happens uncommonly, but it is something that patients should be and their family members should be forewarned um, when this combination is going to be used. Okay, next slide. Anxiety. So I mentioned anxiety specifically here and not depression because I think anxiety for many patients can often be a more disabling symptom than depression, and that is because of the physical manifestations of anxiety where patients can have stomach upset, um, particularly if you're having what's called an anxiety or a panic attack. Your heart can be beating fast. You can be short of breath. You can feel like you're going to die. It's such a severe physical reaction. Um, this sometimes occurs when patients are unable to perform the way they think they should be able to cognitively or that they're in a cognitively stressful situation. They may have this kind of a reaction of severe anxiety. It can also happen in social situations, when in a crowd, when being asked to um, contribute to a conversation with multiple people involved, that can be very difficult. Sometimes people can experience significant anxiety when left alone at home. So they may not wanna be alone, they may not feel comfortable being alone, and that can also lead to significant anxiety. Um, in terms of the management of anxiety, similar to what I said before about agitation, antidepressants have really become the first-line agent. agents. Most antidepressants, all of the newer ones, have indications not only for depression, but also for anxiety, for generalized anxiety disorder, for panic disorder, for obsessive-compulsive disorder, for phobias. So that's why antidepressants are really the first-line medication treatment for anxiety, followed by benzodiazepines, either on an as-needed or scheduled basis, and then finally, antipsychotics. But those would only be used in the event that an antidepressant is not effective from a medication standpoint. Okay, and then one final slide. The paradoxical activation is another controversial term, or syndrome maybe, um, that's been reported in particularly geriatric psychiatry literature, although it appears to be uncommon and not so well studied. But what it is, is a, a paradoxical or counterintuitive reaction to a benzodiazepine that may be that may occur in patients that are older, may occur in patients who have cognitive impairment. So it's with the benzodiazepine class, the same class that we've been talking about several times now. 
So typically, those are anti-anxiety and somewhat sedating medications, so they tend to have a calming effect on patients. We're not trying to put the person to sleep, but they tend to have a calming or soothing effect on patients. That's the desired effect. But instead of that calming or somewhat sedating effect, in this case, the patient is developing agitation instead with increased talking, increased emotion, so emotional lability, and increased activity. So if that happens in the heels of having just started or recently started a benzodiazepine or changed the dose of a benzodiazepine, that could be a red flag that the person is having a paradoxical act, um, activation. Now, it is important to say that sometimes patients are put on these medications because they're already activated. So if somebody is already agitated and then takes a benzodiazepine dose and then is agitated still two hours later, it doesn't mean that the benzodiazepine caused that. It's just as possible or more likely that it was the underlying condition that just wasn't responding yet to the benzodiazepine. So that's paradoxical activation. So I think I've made it through all of the slides now, Angela. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, let's let's turn it to to Suzanne at this stage of the game. Um, Suzanne, you know, we we appreciate you being with us. Um, share with us, you know, what what opportunities families have to um, handle some of these situations in the moment. Well, I think that um, I wanted to go back to one thing that Doctor mentioned very early on in his presentation about um, how to handle, excuse me, how to handle when someone is having psychosis and what does that really mean? And he said that you know you don't want to confront somebody because that can lead to more aggression. At the same time, you don't want to go along with um, the belief or a hallucination. So what do you do by Sort of validating that you understand that your loved one might be um, seeing something or hearing something um, and validate their feelings about this being real to them um, and I think that's um, important for caregivers we get a lot of questions about that how do I handle hallucinations what do I do I think in keeping with the theme of the um, the topic how do you minimize a crisis or hopefully not allow a crisis to occur and there are things that families can do um, in terms of the home environment, um, not having dim lighting, which can lead to shadows, which can lead to visual hallucinations. Decluttering is really important, keeping a very calm environment with music that somebody likes, um, not having on really stressful TV shows, um, really loud TV can help. Keeping communication simple, not a lot of choices or um, a lot of, um, of chatter, but keeping things relatively simple. Also using gentle touch with someone who might be a little agitated. These can be really hard for caregivers who are stressed out. And um, I think the one thing that folks need to remember is that um, people who have DLBD or LBD are not doing this on purpose. Um, it's uncontrollable. It shouldn't be taken personally. Um, and do what you can to diffuse these kinds of situations that might arise. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, you know, I have um, some questions for both of you, and we have some questions from the audience. So I'm going to start with one of mine, because I think um, there's there's always concern that when somebody is having uh, an experience like a hallucination or they're, they're having, a you know, some severe delusion, that there's also a risk for their safety or the safety of somebody else. So how common is it that these kinds of experience result in um, behavior that becomes aggressive or violent? And, and what opportunity and is it, first of all, is it even common? Um, you know, do you see that a lot in the clinic? So let's start with um, Dr. Weintraub. You cut off just through part of it. I think I got most of it, Angela. Um, I think one was how common the psychosis is. Is that correct? I just want to make sure I heard the question. 
how common do, is it that you find out that um, you find com, you know, concerns from families that a loved one with LBD um, is getting aggressive or even violent? Is right. you know in a response to some of these types of psychiatric symptoms? Okay. Um, I think I'm muted still. No, possible? we can hear you. You're good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> You know, it, it is hard to give an exact percentage, I'm thinking, because what we see in the clinic is a biased sample, because the people, at least I see in the clinic, are the ones that are coming in because there's a problem. So if somebody has Lewy body dementia and things are going fine at home, as they may be for many patients, then they're not likely to come in for an appointment to see me, at least. Um, so by the time they come in to see me, then that means that there's an issue. But I would say that these are... Um, not uncommon problems. I would say psychiatric symptoms in general, if you include things such as mood dysregulation, sleep problems, um, hallucinations, delusions, um, if I didn't mention mood disturbances, I'll mention them there, anxiety. If you add all of those up together, they would be very common in patients with Parkinson's disease, dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies. Now, the, the percentage of patients that actually have frank aggression or agitation is I would say less than half at any time, maybe a third, maybe a quarter, um, something like that, maybe, uh, that, but that's a somewhat of a guess. Okay, and certainly it makes a lot of sense that if you're seeing patients as a geriatric psychiatrist, they've already um, uh, exceeded the, um, the ability of their, their current physicians to manage their symptoms, and so there is something more significant going on, and I think that's an important point to make. Um, I have a couple of questions here that came in from the audience, which I, I really think are very interesting. Um, uh, one individual, so the two questions are related to CBD oil or medical marijuana. Um, what does the literature say about the effectiveness of, of this? And, and what do you say to families who want to try this as a, as a way to help with the anxiety or the agitation that, that can be so uncomfortable to live with? So, so I can handle that one. Um, I just gave a presentation this morning and I included um, about the management of agitation in dementias. And I included, um, a recent study published in the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry. There was a study of a THC um, analog that binds to the cannabinoid receptors um, and showed nabilone is the name of the compound and showed some benefit for agitation in this small um, Alzheimer's disease clinical trial. Now, that being said, there have also been negative studies for THC, CBD for agitation in dementia syndromes. There's also some concern, depending on the type of compound used, about whether it could worsen cognition or cause sedation, as this Nabilone study did. So on the one hand, it improved agitation. On the other hand, it was associated with some side effects as well. The amount of literature or study that have been conducted to examine this is almost zero at this point. So um, what patients um, need to do um, um, to get by is one thing. What, what may um, be helpful in their experience is another thing. But what we can point to and say we have some confidence as physicians or treaters that you should actually try is, an, is another thing. So it's kind of uncharted territories, at this, uh, uncharted waters at this point. Um, and the main thing to say is that um, you, you want to not do anything that's going to be harmful or worsen. Not that you shouldn't consider trying something like this, but you want to do it under the safest um, conditions possible. So even if it's not helping the person, which it may not, you want to make sure you're, you know, you're not harming the person. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to ask a question now for both of you. Um, and, and we'll, we'll, start with Suzanne. Um, Suzanne, we have a question that um, somebody's asking if we could elaborate a little bit on vivid dreams that their loved one thinks are real. Um, this individual gets up in the middle of the night and is searching for people in her house. Um, you know, when you're counseling families about how to deal with these types of behaviors and it's nighttime and there's, there's a question about what's real, what's not real, you know, what, you know, how would you advise families to handle that in the moment? Um, first, and just going back to the, the question prior to this, 
um, about aggression, we always recommend if someone does have somebody at home who is showing some aggressive tendencies to notify um, your local police just to make them aware that there may be a situation because you don't want something to escalate and having your local authorities kind of prepared for that I think is a good idea. Um, sleep, this is a tough time because care partners are tired and this could be the time when um, you may not respond as well as you'd like because you're awakened from your sleep. Um, the other thing you have to worry about is safety um, when someone's up and wandering around, um, that they're a fall risk as well. So um, I think, again, working with um, your physician, because there are medications that may be safe to be used to help somebody get a good night's sleep. Um, also understanding if there are other things that are keeping the person up, like maybe drinking water too late um, at night that's making them get up and have to go to the bathroom. But I would say first address, you know, maybe what is waking the person up. And then again, just calmly reassuring um, someone that they're um, that they're safe, you understand what they're feeling, um, but I think this is the time to really be probably at your most reassuring self because it's the time when it sounds like these vivid dreams are probably going to be the scariest. Thank you. And so for Dr. Weintraub, are these hallucinations if they're waking up and they think something or or a delusion if they wake up and that's still staying with them or is this a is this like part of the REM sleep behavior disorder where they might have had this dream and when they wake up it just seems real you know how do we separate that out I'm glad that question was asked cuz I meant to cover it before and, and forgot so what we the, the dividing line we typically use is sleep versus waking state. So if we were going to call something an hallucination or a delusion, the person should be fully awake, attentive, alert. Um, and if they're still having the sensory experience or clearly stating these, uh, making these comments or having these beliefs while fully awake, then we call that an hallucination or a delusion. Anything that happens while the person is asleep or really coming in and out of sleep, we typically would attribute to the sleeping state, so REM behavior disorder if we're talking about that specifically. There also are hallucinations that can happen coming, going into the sleeping state and coming out of the sleeping state called hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations. Typically, we don't treat those because, again, they're so closely linked to the sleep state. Um, so there's what happens while fully awake, what's happening while going in and out of sleep, and then what's happening while fully asleep. And we do try to differentiate those three states. Okay, thank you very much. Um, here's a question, um, and I will, um, let's start with Dr. Weintraub on it, but um, Suzanne, I'm going to give you a part two on this. Um, so. You know, you spoke about later onset LBD. Um, let's talk about what happens in the early stage when people are still um, uh, cognitively functioning fairly well. Um, agitation can happen, you know, in at at any stage of the disease. Same with the hallucinations and the delusions. How do you? Um, what do you find? more common in the early stage from a behavioral standpoint. And then Suzanne, I'd like you to tag on and talk about when somebody's having these um, really repeated themes in their delusions, money or bills or whatnot, um, you know, and they're in the early stage. Do you respond any differently to them? So let's start with Dr. Weintraub on the, the frequency of this kind of thing in, in early disease versus later. I think some of the neuropsychiatric symptoms, um, speaking of this category broadly, are relatively common even in this prodromal state that I mentioned, or at disease onset, or in early disease. And those would include depression, anxiety, the REM behavior disorder. Those all happen potentially early. They do increase over time, but are less likely to be um, to increase so dramatically over the course of the illness. Psychosis and agitation, I think, are 
at least in Parkinson's disease, relatively uncommon in early disease and do increase dramatically with disease, disease duration and um, aging. Part of the reason that happens more in Parkinson's disease is because they get exposed to the Parkinson's medications, which increases the risk. That's less of an issue for dementia with Lewy bodies. So with dementia with Lewy bodies, because there's already significant cognitive impairment at disease onset, and the psychosis is more related to just the disease state, not to medication exposures as specifically, then I think you see the prominent um, hallucinations over well over 50% even at disease onset. But I still think that the, those symptoms, the, the likelihood of having frank um, delusions, of having frank agitation is not as common in early disease. It can happen, but it's not as common, but clearly becomes more common as the disease advances. Okay, thank you. And Suzanne, you know, from, from your perspective, when you're dealing with somebody who's more in the early stage, they're physically healthier, they're, they're cognitively more able, um, do you respond to them any differently when they have these delusions, and, and especially if it's something that's recurrent? Uh, and, and I will say, my father had LBD. He, he too, had very recurrent themes in his delusions. Um, you know, what what are there different strategies when somebody is more functionally able than as the disease progresses? Um, Angela, I don't really think so. I think I use the same approach um, with anyone who's having delusions. I mean, delusions are sort of the mind's way of plugging in missing information. And it's, again, talking about the fact that there's a brain disorder that can um, cause these things to happen, reminding um, and you know, continually going back to the educational piece of it, reassuring the person that you believe that they believe these thoughts are real. Um, and then frequently just kind of talking through why um, they're believing in this. I have a gentleman right now who believes that one of his family members installed a listening device. So we talk a lot about, you know, his feelings about that person and, and you know, reminding him that this is, um, sort of a trick that his brain is, is playing on him, understanding it, validating it, um, but trying to redirect him and try to figure out, you know, where that thinking might be faulty. Okay, thank you. Um, let's, we have a few questions that are specific to medication. So let's take um, one or two of these for, for um, Dr. Weintraub. Uh, there was a question after you um, were talking about Nuplazid, the uh, generic name, Pimavanserin. Uh, a couple of questions um, what, about whether that can be taken alone or with other medications. What do we know about, um, you know, using this drug um, with other medications that people with LBD are typically on, like a cholinesterase inhibitor like donepezil. Can they be combined? Are there risks of combining them with some of the traditional therapeutics in LBD? The only concern that has come up, and it's not specific to pimavanserin, um, but in general, would be that some patients were ending up on two antipsychotics at the same time. So they were already on quetiapin or Seroquel is one example, and then we're having pimavanserin added. Now, for some people, that was just for an acute transition period to get off of one and on to the other, but some people ended up staying on that combination. So I think in general, you, we really don't want somebody to be on two antipsychotics at the same time. I think they just have too much side effect burden for that to happen. Other than that combination, there really are no other specific concerns um, about pimavanserin specifically with other medications. I think if you were going to be on an MAOB inhibitor, you would get the same potential red flag about serotonin syndrome. But again, that use is not so common in dementia with Lewy bodies anyway. Other than that, I think it's fine to be taken with a cholinesterase inhibitor or the other typical medications that an older person might be on, either neurologically, psychiatrically, um, medically. There's no specific drug-drug interactions or metabolism effects from liver that I'm aware of. So I, I don't think that's, um, that, that's a specific concern. 
Okay, thank you. And we had a follow-up question on that same medication, and I would say this is common. This, this we should answer broadly uh, for any type of antipsychotic medication. Is you know, is there a risk for people to have a beer or a drink when they're on medications like this for LBD? You know, how do you counsel your your patients and their families about the use of alcohol with some of these medications? That is a good point, and I think I'm at the uh, li liberal end of the spectrum here because um, I know there's some people, um, clinicians maybe, that would say you, sh you shouldn't drink if you have dementia or you shouldn't drink if you're on a psychiatric medication like an such as an antipsychotic. My, my general viewpoint is that um, people are in a difficult situation, and if they um, ha have enjoyment from having a drink, um, whether it's a beer or a glass of wine, um, and they can tolerate it, most importantly, that you don't want to deprive people of something that's um, enjoyable for them. So I think the question is, can they tolerate that on top of what they're doing? And you can answer the question if somebody has a drink and looks significantly different afterwards, um, then that's probably not a good sign. If they have a drink and they seem to tolerate it fine, then there's no reason otherwise that they can't be on it. There's no um, specific harm other than Maybe they just might become more sedated because alcohol can have a sedating effect. They might have slightly more imbalance or gait problems because alcohol can have that effect. Um, so, but as long as they're not having that as an adverse event, there's no specific reason that a person couldn't have a drink. Um, it shouldn't be more than a drink a day, but um, up to a drink seems like it might be possible. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have um, time for one more question before we have to wrap things up here. Um, so I'm going to select one of my own because I think this is really important for all of us who have loved ones with LBD. And that is, how do we know when an event like this at home that's driven by a psychiatric symptom goes from something we just are working through at home to something that needs to be, we need to notify the doctor about, and, and then beyond that, what constitutes one of these um, incidents that escalates into an actual crisis that requires a trip to the hospital. So, you know, um, and, and Suzanne and Dr. Weintraub, you both may have different perspectives and different at, um, uh, thoughts on this. So let's start with um, Suzanne. Um, at, at what point from, you know, from your time working with families, you know, what do you counsel them on? on what behavioral changes really require a call to the doctor outside of the normal clinical appointment schedule? Um, I think when one's behavior is um, escalating or is very different, and I, I think you have to take in mind families are different and there's different tolerance levels and different support systems that families have, but I think it's always important to notify a physician when there are changes in, in anyone's behavior even if it doesn't necessarily mean a crisis. Um, I think there are a lot, there's lots of time in between doctor's appointments and you may forget these things. Um, and I, so I think it's always good to let your physician know if there's a change in behavior. Okay, thank you. And, and Dr. Dr. Weintraub, from your perspective, when does this transition from something that um, is calling the doctor to notify him that you might need to come back in for an appointment sooner rather than later versus something that really requires a trip to the emergency room. Um, you know, as you mentioned, there's, there's a lot of these symptoms and some of them can result in a crisis, but where's that tipping point where you really need to go right to the hospital? One thing that complicates it um, is that these symptoms can be variable. So if you, um, act on something right away, it's possible that it might have gone away in a half hour, an hour, a couple of hours, um, but you may not be in a, in a position to wait that long. I think anytime um, things tend to be psychiatric emergencies when there's some acute risk to sell for others in some way, um, and the, the risk to self could be harm because the person's out of control. They may harm themselves by falling. They may harm themselves by trying to run out of the house and do something. Um, they could harm themselves in any number of ways. Or if there's harm to somebody who's in the person's environment, a loved one or caregiver, so threats towards that person, physical, verbal aggression. 
I think those are the things that es those are examples of the things that escalate something to an emergency situation where, as Suzanne mentioned before, the police may need to be called or you, the family may need to take the patient in for um, evaluation and maybe um, acute inpatient treatment. Um, other things tend to develop more slowly or smolder, so there's a little bit more time perhaps to um, see how things are going or to call a physician and try to do some modifications as an as a outpatient. Thank you. So safety really is is the big indicator right there then. I, is I that if there's not that risk to a patient or self, even if you go to the emergency room, they're likely to send you home because mm -hmm. that's the criteria they're, you're, they're going to use once you're there, they're there. They're going to say, is this person an acute risk to him or herself or others? And if they can't say yes to that question, they'll say, go home and talk to your doctor. Okay. Well, again, I'd like to thank the both of you for joining us today, for sharing your expertise and your wisdom with all of us. And a big thank you to all of our attendees who also took time out of their day to join us. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Dr. Weintraub is with one of LBDA's Research Centers of Excellence program. Um, we'd really encourage you to learn more about this. So if we could go to the next slide, you can go to our website uh, to lbda.org slash RCOE, oh, and we're going to go back to that slide here. We just skipped over it by accident. Um, this is a, a series of uh, clinics across the country where you will find opportunities to participate in research. You will find uh, experts in LBD, and um, we think it's a wonderful resource for the community. So go and see if there's a resource near you, especially if you're interested in getting involved in the research side of this illness. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the webinar has been recorded and we'll be posting this on our YouTube page within a day or two. So uh, check back with us. We hope that you'll share this along and we can post it on social media and make it that even easier for you. So thank you again for attending our event and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.